This is Wickham Sound. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Archo on Wickham Sound, 106.6 FM. My name is Dane Cobain. I'm your host for the next hour or so. This is the show where we discuss the local arts. We have a different guest on each week. Uh, we also make a few sort of entertainment recommendations. And really, we're kind of dedicated to covering what's happening in and around Wickham, really. Uh, so I've got a few bits of news to share with you in a little bit. Um, and also, I guess, a bit of a retrospective. So um, I've recently joined the team at Wickham Art Centre, which is just off Desborough Road. And uh, we recently had our uh, lockdown art exhibition. So it's kind of been our relaunch event, if you will. Um, and we got a load of different artists involved, sculptors, painters, photographers. Uh, we even had a listening corner with some spoken word stuff and uh, some contributions from various writers. Uh, and on uh, Saturdays as well, we had some live music too. Um, and so obviously we kind of done everything we can to maintain social distancing, etc. We actually had a hundred reusable masks that were made by Fran, who is um, our bar manager who's currently on maternity leave. We were also running like a table service outside and stuff. We had a one-way system, free hand sanitizer, all of that stuff. I think like most people, we're, um, everyone's kind of learning as, as they go at the moment. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting time to host events because there are all these extra uh, considerations that you have to think about to you know, make sure that everything's safe. You, 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 know, you just have to, you can't put on the event if it's not gonna be safe. So you, know, you have to do all like risk assessments and all this sort of stuff to make sure. But um, yeah, it was a really uh, fascinating exhibition. I mean, it was quite inspiring for me just to wander around and see all the different you know, art that people make. I think for me, especially, um, you know, writing is my thing. So I can read a book or look at some writing or something and I kind of understand Understand how you get from nothing to that end result you know when it when I look at like people's art I'm just blown away by just the process how they physically made the art and like the fact that they envision the final piece um, you know because there's a lot of stuff with uh, really like fascinating meanings behind it um, we've talked to one or two of the artists so the other week we spoke to uh, Stephen Colgan and he had a, a sculpture that he made called BC uh, which stands for before COVID and he'd done it just using stuff that he found around the house um, and also during his like daily government approved walks. And um, yeah, it was really fascinating to learn that in itself, that that had gone into the process of it. But also um, just that he did such a great job of creating this physical artifact that looks fantastic and really does, um, you know, encapsulate what life before COVID was like. So I think it's great that... Um, not just Wickham Art Centre, a lot of places in the community are doing things, as we will get to later on in the show. I should really probably shout out some of the local creatives. I mean, there are so many to choose from. Uh, shout out to Juliet from The Tired Dressmaker. She had a, a stand at the uh, exhibition and I got a couple of masks from her, some handmade face masks. Uh, they were very reasonably priced as well, but they also look very cool. So um, yeah, definitely check out her Facebook page if you're interested in that. Um, I really enjoyed Stephen Colgan's statues, um, Dan, Dan Wilson had some great stuff on display, Ed Sylvester had some stuff and he's a really cracking photographer, uh, who else was there, there were so many people, um, Victoria from uh, Dreadfalls Theatre, she's actually going to be this week's guest, she was there, she did some um, like puppet making workshops, Teekster had some stuff out as well, so his stuff is like... Um, it's quite it's like uh, Islamic inspired art, but um, with quite a modern style as well. He's sort of like a you know modern street artist, I guess you would say. Uh, he's got some really good stuff, so definitely check him out on Instagram. A few of our staff members even had bits out on display. Uh, so Ruth and Tabitha both had some paintings up. Uh, yeah, just loads of cool stuff. There's just way too much for me to try and summarise it all here, so I'm not going to. But while I'm on the subject of some local creative stuff, I wanted to mention as well that uh, Victoria, again, she's going to be our guest later on in the show. Um, she's posted to say that she's got some artist studios and theatre rehearsal space available in High Wycombe. Um, so they're starting at £150 a month, going up to £300 a month uh, with hourly rates at £10 an hour for ad hoc hire. Uh, she says they've got 24 hour access uh, for those who are renting on a monthly basis. Parking for loading, town centre location, south facing sunny rooms, men and women's facilities, a kitchenette and a washroom area. Uh, they're currently undergoing repair as well so they should be nice and fresh and new for you guys. So I just wanted to share that in case that's something that any of you might be interested in. 
I also wanted to mention that Sam, Sam Pritchard, he uh, recently ran the uh, Chilton Affordable Art Store inside um, the shopping centre in town, not the Eden Centre, the other one. And um, yeah, he's now got a new location, so he's going to be doing something in uh, the start of September, uh, which will be uh, an affordable arts uh, sale in Beaconsfield as well. So I'll uh, give you more information on that closer to the time, but it's definitely something you're going to want to look out for. This is some new local music. This is a fresh new tune from Circus 66. It's called uh, Monster. The uh, It was released about just over a week or so ago now. And uh, there's a, an official music video that you can check out on their YouTube channel as well. So do go ahead and check that out. And I spotted this because there's a there's a Facebook group called Musicians in High, Wic uh, High Wickham that I would recommend. And uh, yeah, Luke Ward posted it in there. So shout out to him. This is Circus 66 and Monster. Out of my 
Love music. Love talk. Love Wickham Sound. Being a foster carer isn't just about providing vulnerable children a safe home. It's about loving, listening and guiding. It's about changing their lives. If there's space in your home and you have the time and patience, then Nexus Fostering wants to hear from you. We're your local fostering agency, rated outstanding by Ofsted, and we're here to support you in supporting them with full training and a competitive allowance. For a career that really makes a difference, visit nexusfostering.co.uk or call 0800 389-0143. From the 1st of April, your new Buckinghamshire Council will replace the existing county and district councils and continue to deliver all the services you are used to. Visit buckinghamshire.gov.uk Sunday evenings on Wickham Sound. If your idea of a fun festival experience is a mashup of metal, grime, blues, folk, pop, with a smattering of electro, hip-hop, Indian grunge, and not forgetting punk, then join me, Paul, for the alternative Wickstape at 11pm on Wickham Sound 106.6 FM every Sunday. I can even guarantee that the weather will be fine. This is Wickham Sound. It's about that time of the show when I get joined by my weekly guest and this week I'm being joined by Victoria Snaith of Dreadfalls Theatre. I first met Victoria uh, only recently actually. I think we have like, we probably know a lot of the same people and stuff but we uh, crossed paths at the Lockdown Arts Exhibition at Wickham Arts Centre. She was doing um, like a, a, I guess like live puppet making and she had uh, some of her stuff on display there as well and um, she just seemed like such a fascinating person that I knew we just had to get on the show so uh yeah over to victoria snaith what was the last book that you read and what did you think of it what was the last book that i read this is a big question i'm a big reader but Mm -hmm. i haven't read as much recently as i should have been (laughs) reading i think i probably read a book i've read a million times before um, which is uh, The Time Traveller's Wife, yep. which is kind of a science fiction sort of chick literature. Yep. And I've read it many, many times before. I find there is a great joy in revisiting books that you're familiar with. Yeah, right? Sure. There's a sense of comfort. And I think, you know, having some familiarity this year has mm-hmm. been quite important. So, yeah, definitely been revisiting things that I that I love. <laughs> cool. It's funny, I, I saw, um, I don't know whether it, it was a study or what, but um, an article online that was basically saying that's why people sort of re-watch TV shows and, you know, like most evenings I'll be in bed watching Peep Show and, you know, not really paying mm-hmm. attention. But, uh, and, it, and it's, again, that thing of, it's kind of predictability. We know what's going to happen. We know we love the story. And uh, I suppose it's like sort of slipping into an old, you know, an old outfit or something that you've had for years and that just makes you feel comfortable, you know? Exactly. I find if I go on holiday, mm. I won't choose a new book. I will choose a book that I love. Yeah. So one of my favourite books of all time is The Princess Bride, yes, great which book. is uh, made into a sort of a cult film in the 80s, yeah. I think. But um, again, one of my absolute favourite books. And I will take it on holiday with me and I will read it again and again because yeah there is that that sense of comfort like you said putting on that pair of trainers you've had for years and yeah. although it might be falling apart it fits around your foot <laughs> yeah for sure it's interesting you mentioned that the princess bride i mean uh, I've, I've only read the book once i've seen the movie like hundreds of times because it was one of those i grew mm-hmm. up on but um i mean there's there's sort of similarities there between what you do as well because uh, it's very much sort of it's in the vein of a traditional sort of fairy tale or sword and sorcery tale but it also sort of subverts the expectations there as well and I see kind of quite a lot of that in what you do. Yeah, so I, it's really interesting that you say that because the the book and you don't get so much of this in the film but the book is written by an author but he isn't the author mm-hmm. that you're reading. It's a story within a story. So when you read the book, it's written by Morgan Stern or yeah. Morgenstein. And he's saying how this is the, my favorite book that I've ever written, but I didn't write it. Yeah. I actually found this book. And it's a book that my father used to read to me. And I'm now writing it down to publish. And so it's interspersed with these lovely sort of asterisks yeah. and you're reading the story you get to an asterisk and then it'd be like this part of the story has been redacted yeah. and it's this it's sort of breaking the fourth wall of yeah, book yeah. reading right instead of breaking the fourth wall of theater or television and um 
uh, yeah, you're, you're probably right. That probably has had a, quite an influence on mm. me in that kind of making fairy stories, but being super aware that you're making these mm. tales. And uh, yeah, yeah, I've never really thought of that before. That's probably a really great example <laughs> of, uh, of some influence. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and obviously, again, um, I, well, one of the things I wanted to ask is, again, this sort of the idea of the folk tales and the fairy stories sort of working their way into, into what you do. Uh, what are a few of your favourite sort of traditional fairy tales? Mm, okay, so if we had to choose between fairy tales and folk tales, mm -hmm. I'd always go with folk tales. Yep. And uh, there is, there's, you know, there's a difference between the two of them. I enjoy folk tales a lot because they are uh, older. They have changed a lot more than fairy tales. Mm -hmm. A lot of fairy tales are uh, written down. Yeah they have been created for this specific purpose as being fantastical and they have uh, sort of, you know, fairies or magical creatures. But folk tales are a different thing altogether and I, I really love exploring those. So my favourite folk tales are from uh, Norway. Mm -hmm. um, I find those very fascinating. They have a this idea that because they live in the mountains, there are trolls that live in those mountains, but they disguise themselves as the rock yeah. of the mountains. By the cover of night, they come alive, but in the daytime, in the light, you would never know that they're there because they just turn back into rock yeah. again. And I find that wonderful. I find that I such this magical idea of there are things there that you can't see. And there's a children's TV show on Netflix at the moment called Hilda, okay. where part of the stories uh, one of the stories that they follow in the children's show is, is about that. They, they have these trolls that transform and that pleased me to see that there are young audiences being introduced to mm. these folk tales that uh, actually that maybe they wouldn't know because they're from somewhere else you know they're indigenous to another country yeah. and that's nice right Just share, share the love, educate people amazing yeah it's funny, well, because Tolkien kind of used that as well in uh, The Hobbit with the, the trolls in The Hobbit. They have that, again, that element where the, you know, I think the, the thing is, doesn't Bilbo or Gandalf, or I think it's Gandalf, he keeps them talking and then the sun comes up and then they all turn mm. back into stone and that's how they get away. But obviously... Yeah, well, I'm assuming he, he must have had to, must have done some research himself. Yes. He must know some of these stories in order to kind of include them and build all that world building, right? So I think that's why people like... Tolkien because he has such an expansive universe for his characters and they're all based on familiar uh, sort of stereotypes like yeah. you've got fairies, you've got orcs, you've got trolls so he must have been a fan as well I think. Yeah, <laughs> It was funny because he's almost sort of I guess re-established them. I think in a way like how things like say the, the Brothers Grimm did for example where it just sort of becomes mm -hmm. the de facto mm -hmm. version of that tale or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a really interesting thing that, that the Grimm brothers did, of mm. course, is these, these fairy tales existed and they would have started as a, as a folk tale, yeah. but they have been written down and they have been changed and they have been, in, in a lot of ways, uh, made more palatable mm -hmm. for children. I think most people know that fairy tales are much darker than yeah. you give them credit for, but... Um, who knows why? I guess Disney thought that was uh, more marketable, maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Or maybe it's just that uh, maybe like life's become a bit less brutal, I suppose. Because I, I mean, well, a, lo I hope so. <laughs> a, a lot of the time with them as well, there's you know, they're they're actually uh, they're almost uh, like fables or something. Like they have warnings in them that you can take away as well. I think that's probably why they've kind of endured for so long. This is true. This is true. Um, a lot of a lot of folk tales don't even really have fables because mm. they are well they have they have fables but they're so different to yeah. what we would expect we're used to sort of Aesop yeah. you know um, the tortoise and the hare you should take your time yeah. don't rush all that kind of uh, sort of I don't know things that we should teach young people but folk tales tend to be something a lot older mm. so um, there is I don't want to bore you and I apologise there's, okay. tra there's a train of thought that says um, that the environment, the physical environment that a folk tale has been created in, that will affect the type of creatures that are within that folk mm -hmm. tale. So for example, if somebody is living in 
hundreds and thousands of years ago and they live in wood and their particular folk tales for this region are to do with banshees, mm. the sound of spirits wailing in the night. That has come specifically from perhaps the sound of wind whistling through trees. Yeah. So uh, a group of people living thousands of years ago at the same time, but they live in a desert, they wouldn't have banshees. Mm. They would have something else because it relates to the environment. So if you're looking at morals, there isn't a moral that we would mm. perceive, but I suppose the morals are more like, don't go in the woods yeah. at night. You'll get eaten by, insert, yeah. <laughs> banshee, insert, you know. So I think that's interesting that maybe maybe it's the morals that have driven the change of story mm. as, as the society has changed and our expectations and what we think is safe and unsafe those spirits or creatures or monsters that's not what you find in stories anymore yeah yeah for sure yeah a couple of things i want to chat to you about so um obviously i saw you at the uh at the lockdown art exhibition at the art center yeah. and you were doing your <laughs> puppet making workshops uh what mm -hmm. were some of the highlights for you of the exhibition what was the highlight for me the highlight for me was i got to meet so many artists that I just didn't know existed mm. in our local area. Yeah. I I guess I knew they were there. <laughs> yeah. They must be there because there are people who are performing or exhibiting at the art centre and other places. But I had not had the opportunity to meet these people. And that was delightful. And just what I needed as we're coming out of lockdown, knowing that there is an artistic community on my doorstep yeah. and I just didn't know they were there <laughs> <laughs> that was my personal highlight amazing no that's great I, I, I like that so cool yeah. and uh, so according to according to my research correct me if I'm wrong but yeah. I think next year is Dreadful's 10th anniversary right oh my goodness I know it's so funny you said that I was just thinking about that yesterday <laughs> I was thinking I should plan something I should do something special, yeah. but I'm not sure what yet, so, you Watch know, give, give me some ideas, get, you know, write it on a postcard, send yeah. it this way, people. When you're talking about, you know, the effect of, uh, of place on the development of folk tales, um, mm -hmm. you, you guys have, have performed in all sorts of really strange places. Uh, so you've got, <laughs> you've got galleries, crypts, which I'm assuming might be the art centre, I don't know, no, police cells. no. The crypt was a, a legitimate crypt. So there is a, a church in Salford right. where we have performed a couple of shows. And it is, there's a church, it's a working church, mm -hmm. it's still a church, unlike the Wickham Art Centre, yeah. which is obviously being transformed. Yeah, yeah. But underneath this church in Salford, they have a crypt. It is mostly unused. There's only three bodies down there that have been bricked up. Mm -hmm. Um, but you can kind of see they've sort of left gaps, which is a little bit strange, but that's probably a story for another day. <laughs> but you can kind of see inside the, the coffins and they, for some reason, continue to hire this out to us for, for <laughs> events because it is an exceptionally unique venue, mm. but it has certain constraints, it being a crypt yeah. and, you know, things like really boring things like health and safety uh, and capacity but because we've been there a few times we're aware of those yeah. constraints so they're happy for us to continue going back and we always do really well there because people are fascinated by the idea of going into a crypt for mm. a show <laughs> so you actually go out of your way to sort of basically create sets and whatnot that you can easily pack into a van you can take it on the road um, and obviously that presumably that's what allows you to sort of put on events at whatever unusual space uh, you come across but how, how do you manage yeah. to design your sets like that without sort of compromising artistic vision or the quality of the show mm. or anything like that yeah this is a this is a really good question we do get asked this a lot mm. so i went to see just for context a number of years ago it must have been like 2012 or something i went to see a show in london that was a very large scale immersive theater show mm -hmm. and it was absolutely fantastic it was just so wonderful and so tactile and then from then other companies started creating 
immersive theatre. Yeah. They take over a space and you can explore that space in various different ways. But it was very clear to me that it was a scene that you were only really finding in London mm -hmm. and occasionally somewhere else. Like occasionally maybe Manchester, for example. Yeah. Or, you know. um, and people were travelling from all around the country to see this show and they were spending mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds of pounds on travel and hotels. And I thought, well, there are so many unique and kind of unused spaces across the UK why are we not taking these shows to them? Mm -hmm. And you're right, there is a certain planning that has to take place. So you have to choose, you have to sort of choose your show, you have to pick and choose where you're going to go and how you're going to do it. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I can distill that into a <laughs> simple, like, there's no simple answer. It is very, you have to look at the space and think about not just how the action of the actors will move through the space, but also how the audience will move through. Mm -hmm. Because with immersive theatre, the audience is given a level of autonomy where they are in control of their own route yeah. through a room. But of course, you can control that to a level by looking at when does this door open? Is it open the whole time? Yeah. Are they going to follow this character over this character? So I create what I like to call the uh, my tube map. Mm -hmm. Do you like a London tube map? You have all those different coloured lines. Yeah. I will have a floor plan of that venue and I will plot out where characters are going in different colours and therefore I can see like if there's a bottleneck yeah. okay well if there's a bottleneck here that's a problem so we need to make sure that these scenes actually happen further apart or I need to adjust it so in terms of those kind of logistics that's how I deal with it cool. in terms of scenery or set building the trick is to use the venue mm. and what you've got so you like if you're creating a piece of found art, right? You have a piece of driftwood. So you look at it and you're thinking, what am I going to paint on it? Same with the venue. I've got this crypt. Okay, yeah. well, it's only got three corridors and it hasn't actually got rooms. It just has weird alcoves. How do we use that to our advantage? And then you take small items. Set, it's not even scenery. It's mm. almost set dressing yeah it's like it's like decorating it's, the space isn't it almost yeah and that and that's the, that's definitely been the trick trick for us and in some venues it works fantastically and even in some it doesn't i have to you know there are definitely times i've gone oh i missed the mark on that one you know quick let's change it for tomorrow's show yeah. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. My name's Dane Cobain. I'm here in conversation with this week's guest, who is Victoria Snaith from Dreadfalls Theatre. And we're going to check out a little bit more music. So it's been a while since we played him on the show, and I want to bring him right back on. So this is Franz Elol with Carrick Fergus. He's a harpist. It's incredible if you get to see him live. It's not every day that you get to see someone sort of performing a harp in front of you. And uh, yeah, definitely check him out if you can. Thank you. 
that was Carrick Fergus by Franz L. Earl. My name's Dane Cobain. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. And we're going to jump straight back into our little chat with uh, Victoria Snaith from Dreadfuls Theatre. One of the things I want to ask you about, and uh, you sort of mentioned this before we started the interview, but uh, you do a lot of work with uh, schools. Um, what's yeah. what's the most rewarding thing about working with kids? Um, oh, that's such a sweet question. So... Uh, when I was training to work with a particular company to teach in school, so mm-hmm. I specifically teach uh, drama and dance and music, puppetry, performing arts related yeah. uh, things. When I was training with a particular company to go into school, my my tutor said to me, think of a teacher that really sticks in your head, this, this teacher that changed your life. Mm-hmm. And I thought of my A-level teacher called Mr. Pollock, who I'm hoping, and he still lives in sort of the Highwick and Beaconsfield area, so you never know, you might hear this. He was my sociology teacher, and he, for some reason, just really believed in me. I Mm. used to, as a sort of, you know, artsy teen, used to come to lessons wearing a beret, (laughs) and that was my style, and he would say, you look like a French revolutionary, and... I, I think that one day you're going to change the world. You're going to do something really great with your life. And he, that really touched me. And this tutor said, you will be that teacher for somebody else. Mm, I love that. And yeah. I thought, no. I thought, no, no. I, that, I didn't believe her. I just thought, that's a sweet sentiment, but that's mm. absolute rubbish. And then I did. I became that teacher for someone. And uh, I... I don't know, I sort of feel very emotional when I talk Mm. about it because it was so touching. But also the power that you hold, because on the flip side, there's definitely teachers that we all remember who we did not like. They made us feel small or they made us feel stupid. So you have to use that in the right way. You know, there's there's, there's a power dynamic. You're a teacher and there's a student and you hold the power to be the teacher that will change their life or the mm. teacher that will really affect their confidence. And so, for me, always aiming to be that great teacher is what <laughs> kept me going back to teaching. Amazing, great. So um, I want to ask about a few of uh, your questions and some of the different shows here. Um, yeah, one, sure. one, one thing that I'm dying to know uh, what what would somebody find inside a forgotten suitcase at Sprinkle Dinkle International Airport? Oh, this is a cute show. Okay, so that is from the Lost Luggage Adventures, and that is a children's show. It's for quite young children. Mm-hmm. And in the show, we have T and G, and they mm-hmm. work at Sprinkle Dinkle International Airport, and their job is to go through all of the bags that have been lost. And that is the premise of the show. They are looking for bag 0001. <laughs> and they've been looking for years for this bag that's gone missing and they're trying to return it to its owner. Yeah. And then every time they think they found it, they pick up a box, they pick up a bag, pick up a suitcase, they open it, and inside is a story. And that story is a fairy tale or a folk tale that we have um, adapted or taken inspiration from. And you open it up, and there might be a miniature set inside. Mm. There could be puppets. There could be costume. And then we we explore that story. And of course, at the you know spoiler alert, at the end we may find the correct suitcase. But mm. you know, I can't say for sure. I don't want to spoil it for <laughs> anyone. <laughs> Amazing, great. And um, also, you know, you because we've talked a lot about some of the sort of the more kid-focused shows, but you do stuff for adults as well, right? So like uh, Patient yeah. 4620 really caught my eye. That sounds fascinating. Yeah, so we, we started off making... Um, I, I, we started off making work for, for adults. Mm-hmm. We did a lot of immersive theatre. We were hired by other companies to enhance their events by providing things like um, sort of... Uh, I don't know, you find a character and they give you clues and they send you on a treasure hunt to find something. You know, interactive, yeah. fun games that you would find at um, almost like kind of, not club nights, but those kind of mm. experiential type events that you sort of get in, in London and Bristol and places. Yeah. And then from that, we started doing more uh, large-scale immersive theatre. Um, 
we diversified and now we do things for children as well we create immersive worlds for children too because there is a great deal uh, of benefit mm -hmm. to young children not sitting in a seat in a rigid fashion yeah. just watching us we, you know, the tactile nature is very relevant to young people mm. but yes we started off making things for adults and uh, was it patient that you saw was that what you oh, no, I haven't seen I saw I, I haven't actually obviously seen it but I'd love to oh, but yeah, I was yeah. reading about it yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Patient 4620 was a, a show that we, we, we started at an art centre. Mm -hmm. So we were based at the art centre in Wickham for a year and we were uh, afforded time and space to experiment yeah. and sort of try new things, which when you're working in theatre is something great. Mm. Not having, <laughs> you know, a looming time over your head that you have to get something done by and ticket sales that you have to get in. Yeah, you yeah. Know, we were afforded this time. So Patient 4620 um, did very well there and we went on to take it to a few different places and that is a an immersive theatre show where you are going to a gallery, you go to a, go to a museum and you are given a headset. So everyone who goes to that show is given a headset with mm -hmm. an audio guide. The audio guide starts very, sort of very dryly, you know, welcome to the museum yeah. of such and such. This number, you know, number one is an oil painting of X, Y, Z. But as you move through the gallery, that story starts to emerge and you as an audience member have to make decisions as to how you interact mm. with the art or whether you don't interact with it because some people don't want to some people yeah. just want to experience the story and that's the beauty of immersive theatre but there are people who love to there are people who are picking up pens and they are <laughs> scribbling on paper and they are fully getting involved and that's quite fun to see but it's a, it is a scary show it, yeah. is a, it is a horror genre yeah. it is not for the faint of heart yeah, yeah. Um, and that was definitely we pushed some boundaries in that one and uh, we have to give a like a content warning people yeah. invited to, to that one because we were pushing boundaries mm. not because the content is necessarily horrifying but you have to remember that somebody has a headset on mm. so they can't hear anything that's going on around them and we have this voice that's talking to you and we have a soundtrack that has been specifically created to tap into different emotional responses yeah. and when I made it, I wanted it to be scary and disorientating, but I'm so close to the project yeah. that I didn't realize actually how disorientating it was for some people. We did have some people who, they had to stop the audio yeah. guide and yeah. take a moment to kind of, okay, this isn't real, it's okay, I'm just, I'm just in a, you know, I'm just in a crypt, yeah. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> well, I, I think as well, I, probably part of that is also due to, again, this sort of, this sort of multi-format approach where again it's much more mm -hmm. experiential it's it's much more hands-on and involved than going to a, a movie and watching a horror movie or something like that you know where <laughs> i don't know it's, it's this like the same difference between say watching a zombie movie and participating in one of those things where you've actually got people dressed as zombies chasing you and yes. i can imagine your, your physical reaction this will be is, totally different this you know? is it this is it. it it definitely plays into uh gosh, what's it, fight or flight? Mm. You know, you you start, your heart starts beating, you start sweating, and you're thinking, gosh, am I actually, am I actually enjoying this? Mm. And of course, there are people that love that. I mean, that's why we go to haunted houses. Yeah. That's why we go to theme parks, because there are adrenaline junkies who really enjoy the thrill of being scared, but knowing that ultimately they're safe. Yeah, yeah. And um, that's what we were playing into with this particular show. Cool. Uh, okay, so just a couple more questions to end on. Um, yeah. which one I think is quite, quite a, obviously quite a timely one, but I think it's an important one as well. Um, how have you been affected by COVID as like you know touring, performing artists, effectively? Mm, it has been a strange ride. It is a, it is a strange time to be working in an industry where your job is to get a lot of people into a space together. Mm. And you can't, things as well. Yeah. you can't do that. Yeah. At the beginning of the lockdown, I decided I was going to sort of just sit and 
let the ride take me where it was going. Mm -hmm. I, I was watching a lot of other colleagues and companies, bigger and smaller, who were really fighting to, we're going to put this show online, we're going mm -hmm. to record this, we're going to record that, we're going to put this out. And I made the decision that I would only take things that came my way during that time. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to give myself undue stress and work looking for something that maybe wasn't there. Yeah. And I think that that has paid off. I've been in a very privileged position where I haven't had to worry that I couldn't pay my rent mm -hmm. because I didn't have a show. And I'm very aware of that, that privilege for many reasons during lockdown, right? There's a lot of things that have made us think about our position yeah. in the world. And I've, I've been really forced to go, okay, you know what? I, I'm lucky. I live in, I basically live in the countryside. I can go outside. There's no one around. I can walk for an hour and see no one. Yeah. I don't have to worry. So in that sense, has it affected my business massively? Not, not in a horrible way. Not, I'm not now bankrupt or anything yeah. like that. It just has given me time to sit back and look at what has been working and where we would like to go from here. Because it is picking up now. Business is yeah. picking up. I have a show in September. Um, I've got a show, a Christmas show, booked up for six weeks from mid-November to Christmas Eve, and then a show at the end of January. So it is picking up. It is... But, uh, yeah, I just have to plan effectively, right? Got to get those yeah. thumbs on seats in a safe fashion that's it yeah and the safety is obviously paramount yeah mm -hmm. well, well that kind of leads me nicely onto my, my last question which is just sort of what's next for you and where can people find out more about you yeah thank you um i have a, a festival so it's outdoors i didn't make this festival i should add mm -hmm. it's called the new forest fairy festival um it is a day festival it's not a camping one for people who are coming so mm -hmm. if anyone wants a day out and they want to do something fun with their young ones. The New Forest Fairy Festival in Hampshire is definitely the place to go. That is, I think, the 26th and 27th of September. And um, we will be performing one of our most popular shows. They invite us back every year. Mm. They're absolutely one, wonderful organisers, these people who run this festival. And then after that, more locally in High Wycombe, I will be teaming up with Wickham Santa mm -hmm. to do an interactive Christmas experience. Um, it was at the front room last year, yeah. but this year we are moving, so they will have to keep an eye out online. But it's going to be magical and lovely and fantastic, and I'm working very hard to make it as COVID secure as possible. Yeah. So hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, people by Christmas will be ready for some magic. Yeah. They will be ready for I think, that. <laughs> I think we all we all deserve some by now, don't we? Yes. Oh, yeah, they, yeah we do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. Um, and did you want me to... I don't know, should, should I give a link? Yeah, yeah. Like, um, how yeah, so link? How you, does it work? Yeah, just shout out whatever, really. I think uh, your website, Have you? I don't know if... You, yeah, you guys have got a Facebook page and stuff as well. Yeah, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, we have a website as well, and that is Dreadful Theatre. And, yeah, I mean, please come and follow us. Come and see pictures of what we do, support the local art. Yeah. <laughs> and have a good time while you're at it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It'd be nice to it'd be nice to like I said, when I met all these wonderful artists and connected with all of these people in Wickham, it would be lovely to keep doing that yeah. as lockdown is released. I would love to meet more of the local community and engage with people. So we'll see how it goes. Well hopefully some of them will hear this and uh, come down to some of your shows. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much, Victoria Snaith, for joining me. And, uh, yeah, definitely check out Dead Falls Theatre online when you get a chance. Uh, is, is anyone else thirsty? I, I'm feeling a bit thirsty, so uh, we're going to have some pure lemonade by Occasionally David. Ski! 
Love music. Love talk. Love Wickham Sound. Being a foster carer isn't just about providing vulnerable children a safe home. It's about loving, listening and guiding. It's about changing their lives. If there's space in your home and you have the time and patience, then Nexus Fostering wants to hear from you. We're your local fostering agency, rated outstanding by Ofsted, and we're here to support you in supporting them with full training and a competitive allowance. For a career that really makes a difference, visit nexusfostering.co.uk or call 0800 389-0143 Hi, it's Pippa here. Join me every morning at 7 o'clock for the Wickham Sound Breakfast Show featuring all your usual favourites including Carefree Karaoke The Breakfast Banger Chikatita's Choice and in an effort to keep your morning routine as normal as possible We'll be taking the register at 8.45. I'll name check all the people that have been in touch with me every morning. So why not tweet me, send me a message on Facebook or email studio at wickhamsound.org.uk. Don't be late now and no skulking behind the bike sheds. That's the Wickham Sound Breakfast Show every weekday morning from 7. This is Wickham Sound. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM at Wickham Sound. My name is Dane Cobain. I'm your host as always. And as always, you can find us on Facebook if you just search for The Art Show Wickham Sound. You can also get in touch with me here at the studio if you drop me an email on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That is D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. I especially want to hear from you if you're a local musician, poet, any kind of... Uh, if Basically, if you've got some audio that we can play on the show... I want to hear from you. Um, don't worry, it doesn't have to be like super amazing high quality. Home recordings are fine, especially if you've got like original songs and stuff because uh, I'm all about that life. So we've reached the point of the show where I share a couple of things to kind of keep you entertained until next week. So we always share a book, a TV show and a movie slash a movie, whatever, same thing, <laughs> and an album as well. So this week's book is going to be Dance Macabre by Stephen King. I actually uh, read this recently when uh, I went to visit my mum in the Midlands. In fact, she's in High Wycombe right now when you're listening to this. Um, and uh, yeah, we visited uh, Bletchley Park as well. But while I was um, traveling, I always take like usually the longest unread book I've got. And it's usually a Stephen King book. And it's really fascinating, actually. Um, it was written in about 1982. So it's kind of dated because it's kind of part memoir and part like almost like a guide to um, horror and like weird fiction in terms of literature, television, uh, radio shows, all kinds of stuff really. So it's a fascinating little read but also again it's kind of dated in places. For, uh, for example King's talking about this exciting new punk band called The Ramones and um, he was like complaining that there are no uh, good horror things out there or whatever that are about cars and he wrote Christine and From a Buick 8 so he's written two horror books about cars. Although I haven't read Christine and From a Buick 8 was terrible, so don't read that one. This week's album is a bit of a weird one. It's uh, Come On A D by uh, Louise Attack, which is a French band. And uh, it's it's French rock, man. But uh, they've got a great song on it called L'Intranquillité, which is... Uh, well, I learned to play it on guitar. I can't really pronounce it because I'm still working on my French. And also, I've, I've been trying to relearn German as well. So I, I learned French for five years at school, did German for two. And that was like... 16 17 years ago so my french is a lot better than my german my german i'm about as far as hello ich bin dane ich komme aus england <laughs> whereas in french hopefully i'm slightly better than that <laughs> but yeah come on a d by uh, louise attack french rock uh it's good stuff and for this week's movie or TV show, well, it can only really be one thing, which would be The Imitation Game. It's based on a book by Andrew Hodges called Alan Turing, The Enigma, and that's the uh, official biography of Alan Turing. The Imitation Game is basically all about Alan Turing and the rest of the team at uh, Bletchley Park who were doing work to uh, decode the German Enigma device. And obviously, well, I watched it uh, last night at the time of recording because today at the time of recording was when I went to Bletchley Park with my mum so um, we watched it to get ourselves in the mood and uh, it still holds up uh, Benedict Cumberbatch is uh, he plays Alan Turing and he's just 
I mean, he's kind of perfect for the role in a way. He, he does... I almost feel as though it's almost a little bit tight cast for him, but um, he does a great job in the, in the role. There are some bits that are kind of made up for Hollywood effect and whatnot, but as a general rule, it does give you a pretty good insight into, you know, who Alan Turing was and what, what it was that he did. Um, I can't attest to whether the film was accurate as to his character because you know by all accounts not really i think he was i don't know in the movie he was just uh he, he came across as quite mean a lot of times like he was being willfully um you know willfully ignoring people's um you know feelings and and whatnot and just focusing very purely on like the job in hand which i'm sure he did do but um you know by all accounts he wasn't that much of a nightmare to work with everyone sort of knew he was a genius and um you know everyone felt that he didn't get the recognition he deserved because well, spoiler alert, obviously uh, during during the war and immediately afterwards, the government couldn't exactly release that it had cracked the Enigma. Um, the Soviets still carried on using Enigma devices after the end of uh, uh, the, for the, for the Second World War as well. So um, it's only kind of recently, really, that the whole story's kind of come to light. And uh, Turing, of course, uh, he commits suicide after um, basically being bullied by the government because he was homosexual at a time at which it was illegal. So I think it's uh, important to share his story. Fun fact as well, um, some people think that the uh, the logo for Apple, the phone company, is a reference to Alan Turing because he ate a poisoned apple. And, you know, the very he actually kind of imitated the fairy tales, I suppose. But... Um, Steve Jobs was asked about it and he said no and he, he wished that they had had that idea but it was just a coincidence. So anyway that brings me to about the end of this week's show. As always thanks a lot for listening. I'm your host Dane Cobain. This is the Art Show on Wickham Sound. Find us on Facebook etc. Uh, thank you to this week's guest who was Victoria Snaith from uh, Dread Falls Theatre. You can go ahead and find them online. You can also look forward to uh, few a uh, few of their shows coming up including over Christmas so I'll try and keep you updated on those uh, as, as and when. I will see you next week. This is Wickham Sound.